Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our inaugural presentation in the Culture of Gardening series. Uh, the Culture of Gardening series or effort is, if you will, is an effort by the OSU Extension Master Gardener Program to highlight the voices of gardeners growing plants to connect with their heritage, culture, and identity. My name is Gail Angelato, and I am the statewide program leader for the OSU Extension Master Gardener Program. My pronouns are she, her, and it is my pleasure to um, host our special guest here today, Aberly, who will be presenting The Work is in Our Hands. Before I introduce Abra, I wanted to pause to do a land acknowledgement. This is something that we started doing in the OSU Extension Master Gardener Program because reflecting upon land and who has access to land and the importance of land to many types of gardening is something that can help us go deeper into our own understanding of gardening to us and what it means to others and barriers that may be faced by others. When we do land acknowledgements, we typically, the person who does it, does it from the spot on which they are um, residing. Today, I'm joining you from Pasadena, Maryland. I'm fully vaccinated and had not seen my parents who are in their 80s in 19 months. So when I was fully vaccinated, I took the chance to come home uh, to Pasadena. Uh, I am standing on the ancestral homelands of the Picasso excuse me, Piscataway Conoy tribe, um, who are Algonquin peoples. The ancestral lands of the Piscataway ran from the western shore of the Chesapeake Bay to the watershed of the Potomac, as far north as Baltimore and as far south as northern Virginia. Uh, the Piscataway first made contact with European settlers in 1608 uh, when they were contacted by John Smith. Uh, colonialization of the ancestral Piscataway land started in 1638. And in 1666, uh, as tensions related to land access started to become more fervent, uh, the Piscataway worked with Lord Baltimore to establish uh, the Piscataway Manor uh, for the Piscataway tribe. The Piscataway people were farmers on large tracts of land. They were also craftspeople, fishers, and tradesmen. Um, I, unlike with Oregon State University, where we have a prepared land acknowledgement, I could not find one for this particular space on which I'm standing, but it was incredibly meaningful and interesting to me to learn a little bit more uh, basically about the land on which my childhood home is located. With that, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce our special guest today, who I mentioned is the inaugural keynote for our Culture of Gardening series. Aberly is a speaker, writer, and founder of Conquer the Soil, a community that combines history, art, fashion, and culture to raise awareness of ornamental horticulture. She spent a whole lot of time in the dirt as a municipal arborist, extension agent, airport landscape manager, and more. Lee is a graduate of Auburn University College of Agriculture and an alumna of the Longwood Gardens Society of Fellows, a global network of public horticulture professionals. Abra is going to be speaking to us today for about 45 minutes. If you do have questions, please put them in the Q&A pod, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. We're really looking forward to this presentation, Abra. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Gail, for that very warm introduction. And I want to thank all of y'all for taking the time to be with us today. Um, I, my intent, I want to state my intention of this presentation, and we'll get right into it, is that when this is over, you will feel uplifted and empowered and just um, proud, not just of Black American garden history. This is American garden history. This is world history, if we're being honest. So. Um, I just hope that you are able to learn and find joy and go spread it and speak these people's names, speak their names 
into existence um, as we move forward. I want to be very clear that it was around the 1920s when we first start seeing uh, the the in the print media the mention of black garden clubs, and there was a real reason for that, and we'll get to why. However, I want to also present to you that it started way, way, way before then when black people started uh, creating and curating their own garden clubs. And the gentleman that you see on the left, this is a man that really needs no introduction and certainly didn't during his time, Booker T. Washington, a very controversial figure of black history. And regardless of how you feel about him, this is the wizard of Tuskegee. And he assembled some of the greatest plantsmen, horticulturists, landscape architects, architects uh, known in the world, in the United States of America, and is considered the Wizard of Tuskegee, the HBCU down in Alabama. He does this after leaving Hampton University. He is a star student there. He is handpicked to start this new school in Alabama. And what's important about this new school in Alabama, Tuskegee Institute at the time, is that the information that the children are taught, this farming, this agricultural, this horticultural information, they are to take that information back into their communities. And this predates the 1920s by, by many, many years, about 20 to 30 years, maybe even 30 to 40 years when he's setting it up. Now, one thing about Washington is that he deeply believed that his connection to nature and growing up outdoors is the reason that he was such a successful businessman, orator, and just personality in his lifetime. And he's married three times. And this is a picture of his third wife. Her name is Mrs. Margaret Murray Washington. And Washington goes on a trip to the UK and they visit a college called Swanley Horticultural College. It is an all girls horticultural school. And at that school, they see young women, college age women, just like the ones at Tuskegee, applying horticulture to their daily routine. Now, this is a time that it is not considered uh, favorable for young women to do outdoor type work. And what they see the women doing is floriculture work. They see them doing shrub installation. They see them doing landscape planning and beautification. And so Mrs. Washington and Booker T. Washington, they take these ideas back to Tuskegee and they have to form a plan to do it because the students really are not engaged. And this is what they do. They form a plan to do outdoor work for girls. And these are actually some of the young girls at Tuskegee, I must say fashionably doing the outdoor work out there. I've never dressed like that in my airport days, but perhaps I should have. And the reason this is important is because it, it really was an unpopular thing for young women to do this type of gardening work. However, what the Washingtons do is that they study the group and they figure out who the most popular girl in the group is, the most popular ones, and they, essentially say in 2021 speak, if y'all think it's cool, everybody's gonna think it's cool. So this is the plan. We're gonna start teaching outdoor work for girls to the women. And I mentioned that the students at Tuskegee take this information back into their community. So when you think about your great, great grandmama, women like that, this is how this landscape information, this formalized information is being dispersed. And by formalized, I mean, there was a time that black people didn't have the leisure time to create their own landscapes and now they have and they are going forward um, with this new knowledge. Now this other gentleman who really needs no introduction, this is George Washington Carver and a lot of times we just think of him the peanut as the peanut man and this is some of his artwork from the World's Fair that he was doing. And I bring this up because so many, gardening is an art. It really is an art and a science and that's what the garden clubs produce. And when I talked about those young women at Tuskegee, prior to the boom of the garden clubs in the 1920s, 1930s, George Washington Carver was already putting out his own material, just hundreds and hundreds of documents on how to landscape communities. And this is one that you see here. At the time, the word used was Negro. Of course, today we use Black or African-American. And these are literally spelling it out how to put your landscape in. And if you look in your bottom right corner on your screen, he's even talking about with beautification. You can use butter beans and hide your fences with vines. So these 
women are doing this work, these men at Tuskegee are doing this work, and they're starting to form their own garden clubs in their own communities. Now, not in the mainstream, no one, but down in Alabama and other HBCUs. So this is when things really start popping off. In World War I, the United States is at war with the world, everybody, it seems like, definitely in Europe. And war gardens are built. Women are home to take care of the home, raise the kids, teach the children. The men have gone off to war. And Americans are forced to grow their own food, the war gardens. And of course, the name changes over to Victory Gardens. And this is really important because something else important is going on at the same time during the early 1920s. And that's the women's suffrage movement. And I wanna be very clear that there were black women, other women of color fighting the good fight, knowing that they were not going to have the opportunity to vote. Um, should this all uh, be executed, the, the, the right to vote by these women, but yet they fought anyway. And when this happens, when the 19th amendment is passed, 2.5 million women who are part of these federated clubs, these social clubs or just women's clubs, they now have the right to vote and they execute it. And what they do is they go to Washington and say, hey, we've got these war gardens. That's all well and good. Now they're victory gardens, but we want better homes in America and better homes deserve better gardens, just like the magazine that you hear. Um, and so the women that have executed their right to vote, those 2.5 million women have voted President William Harding into office. So if 2.5 million people essentially give your vote, they got your ear and they have your uh, uh, attention in Washington. And what the women want, specifically this one woman, what they demand is a National Gardening Week. And this isn't a frivolous thing. They're saying, look, there's more to gardening than just growing your own food, you can make things beautiful. And Harding agrees with them. And so if you look to your left, you see that the, this is the first National Garden Week that ever happens in the United States of America. A committee is formed. And what happens a year later is that Harding dies suddenly. He just drops dead. Calvin Coolidge, his vice president, becomes president. And so he takes on this movement of National Garden Week. And in his mind, by 1930, the United States will be the garden capital of the world. But it's this woman that you see right here in the corner, and I hope you can see her, my, my video is blocking me. Her name is Marie Mattingly Maloney, Marie Mattingly Maloney, and she is a journalist. This is a woman that is the editor in chief of newspapers and magazines, and it is her idea to curate this whole Better Homes movement in America. So I just wanted to be clear that Black people were doing their own thing in garden clubs, in their own spaces. And then this movement takes off a little bit later, if not simultaneously across America. And we start to join in uh, as the country goes forward with this movement. So energy is building. 1930 is the year that things are really supposed to be happening. And of course the, the Great Depression comes. Nevertheless, in Hampton, Virginia, a interesting report comes out of the paper and people are hearing things about this new state organization of gardens that is launched. And launched it is. And there are four people at the table that day. The first one is a gentleman named Asa Sims. And honestly, I could give you a whole hour's presentation just on his career. It is that um, it is honestly that unbelievable, but we're just going to focus on his, his role in the garden clubs uh, for today. And he is a floriculture professor at Hampton. He's the head of the floriculture department. He heads up the greenhouses, and he's also the liaison to the Better Homes movement in the state of Virginia at the HBCUs, at the Historically Black Colleges and Universities. So he's ready. He wants to help move, push this garden movement forward. Another person that is there, our queen, the only woman at the table, Mrs. Ethel Early Clark, she is there. And she is highly influential. She is the first president of what will now be formed called the Negro Garden Club of Virginia. Then Mr. PJ Chesson is there. This is a principal and an educator um, in the Hampton Roads area, Mr. Purvis John Jefferson, and then the director of extension, Mr. William Cooper. So these four people 
are the ones that launch, organize these seven starter clubs, these charter clubs, the Negro Garden Clubs of Virginia, and they're on a mission. And this is our queen, Mrs. Ethel Early Clark with her big lit garden club. That's a picture of them actually doing some work. They have three goals here, to stimulate greater interest in gardens, to disseminate helpful information concerning better gardens because they want better beautification in their communities. And then also to encourage the study of plants and beautification. And this isn't just with women, this is with men, this is with children, this is to fight blight in their areas. And they are focused, they are organized, and they are ready to get to work. Now, I know this picture is a little bit grainy, but I want to show you um, how quickly things take a turn of events. This is at the third anniversary of the Negro Garden Clubs of Virginia. So the seven clubs start. A year later, they're up to 17 clubs. And this is the third anniversary. And what you see in the middle is a woman named Mrs. Ruth B. McCoy. The gentleman standing up uh, in the, the one that's kind of uh, closest to her, um, he's actually passing her a silver vase. And Mrs. Ethel Early was so invested in these black women in their clubs. Every year she put up the money to award a silver vase to the winning club, the club that did the most work, the most beautification work, had the most impact in their community. And this is Mrs. McCoy accepting the trophy from Asa Sims, who I just showed you earlier uh, on that third anniversary. And this is for the Huntersville Better Garden Club. So they are not looking for the mainstream to recognize them, they're recognizing themselves. And I think that's really important that these everyday people are doing the work and keeping themselves motivated throughout the process. Now back to Mr. Asa Sims. He believed in illustrated garden lectures. He knew, this was before PowerPoint, but if he was alive today, I would think that Asa Sims was still probably doing it his way. He knew that illustrated lectures were the way to teach people. And by illustrated, this is him sitting down at the table. You see the plant at the table and you see a 3D model. He creates 3D models of the right way. And I say that in air quotes, because there are many right ways to landscape and also a, a less desirable landscape. That's the other 3D model he would bring around. And you see this group of people, this group of black people in Virginia, highly engaged, ready to learn, ready to learn about plantings, what he called his five point program, laying out pathways, installing shrubs, having floriculture as part of your repertoire in uh, gardening. And this is how he taught his work and he took this all around the state of Virginia. So as the state advisor of these black garden clubs, and then also not just in Virginia, he took it down to North Carolina. And I told you this idea, it really spread like wildfire. And the reason he did that is because he was under the belief that beautification was open to everyone. It was not a socioeconomic type situation that uh, allowed you to beautify or not beautify, whether you were in a rural area or an urban area, like the, the ones in Virginia, you have the opportunity to beautify your community. One of the rural areas that he went back to, he went back to his home state of North Carolina. And this is a picture from Bricks, North Carolina, B-R-I-C-K-S. And it is about as country as it sounds. I've never been, but my people are from Barnesville, Georgia. And this house and this type of vernacular rural black landscape with uh, just the, the not just fully formed shrubs and one over here, one over there. This is, looks so familiar to me. It looks just like home. And this is the type of work that Asa Sims and some other people were doing down in Bricks, North Carolina to help the people there engage in their community and do beautification work. And this is um, one of the reports that they put out about the schoolwork. It says today their garden club is one of the most thriving organizations at Bricks. Now, I don't know what was jumping off in Brick besides the garden clubs, but the fact that it was thriving, it was the talk of the town, that is enough for us as garden lovers. We are pulling for y'all down in Brick, North Carolina. They also talk about this. And again, these are rural people, and I think it's important to acknowledge them because so often folks from the country are forgotten. And they talk about, this is just written so eloquent. They talk about the names of birds they already know, others they wanna learn, they identify the flowers and the trees and the woodland. They tell each other of flowers they like the best and want most in our own gardens. It is the topic of conversation and the people of Brick are getting to work. This is one of the homes there in Brick. And again, you can see very much that vernacular garden landscape style and focus your attention over here on the corner. Uh, this nice lady sitting over here to the side, 
This is her. I don't know her name, but what I do know, she is proud as a peacock, y'all, sitting there in front of what we would call a rockery in landscape speak. Uh, you see, she's got this trellis above her head. She's probably made out of some pallet. She has her hat in her lap with her hands crossed and she is ready for this photo because she knows she must have the baddest garden in brick and I really wouldn't argue with her. And so this is the type of beautification work that was being done hidden in plain sight by black people, thousands, tens of thousands of black people all throughout the South with their garden clubs in these rural uh, country little towns. So the garden clubs are starting to have a glow up. They are um, really making uh, a, a way to organize. They are collecting their own money. They are paying their own dues and they are taking out ads in the paper. This is one to the Journal and Guide in Norfolk and they are congratulating the newspaper on their many years of service. And this is from the what was then called the Negro Garden Club of Virginia. And I wanna direct your attention here. The Linwood Beautification Group, they are one of the charter members of the Garden Club. And if you look up underneath, it says Mrs. Florence Chesson President. Well, that is the wife of Purvis John P.J. Chesson, one of the founders of the group. And I wanna show you, this is the oldest uh, garden group that was in Norfolk at the time. I, I don't know that they're still in existence, but this was a picture of them back then. So they were very serious about this beautification work they were starting to do in their communities. Now back to Asa Sims, it's 10 years later, he's got a little less hair on top of his head, he's pulled out his glasses, he's gotten a little bit older, but he is 10 years in the game of organizing these state garden clubs. And they are about to have a 10th anniversary. They've gone from seven clubs to hundreds of clubs. And the woman that says the work is in our hands is before you all today. This is Mrs. Lillian Hughes Savage. She is the president of the Negro Garden Club of Virginia at its 10th anniversary. This woman was a civic uh, leader in her community and also a religious leader in her community. She was very well known, very beloved, and the president of her own garden club. And part of that 10th anniversary, she gives an address to the men and women that are part of these garden clubs in the state of Virginia. They gather back at Hampton for their 10th anniversary. I do wanna note that every year they move around their annual convention, but for the 10th year, it's back at Hampton. And this is what she says. She says, we pledged ourselves that we would engage in this much needed uh, work and beauty. The work is in our hands. And this is the part that I find very much read between the lines and why it's important to put things into context, why I brought up the women's suffrage movement and the right to vote, and why when millions of women start voting, you are gonna support their programs if you wanna be reelected to office. She talks about we must carry on and complete this beautification work. It's our job, we must overbalance ugliness with beauty. So at this time, World War II is completely popping off. Uh, the folks are back at war back in Europe and the birth of the civil rights movement is also starting. So black Americans are fighting two wars. They're having to go to Europe, fight this World War II, but yet in their own home in the United States of America, they are living under Jim Crow, under segregation. And so this is right at the start of when the civil rights movement is birthed. And there's been many iterations of it. And I'm talking about the one that starts in the early 1940s through uh, let's say the 1960s, that's the movement that I'm saying. So she is very well aware of the double ugliness, the double ugliness of the landscape, the double ugliness of war, and also the ugliness of the Jim Crow era. And she knows that I'm, I'm gonna fight this and not lose my joy and not lose my pride. I can do it by, by beautifying my community, by fighting blight. For the 10th anniversary, and not only does she uh, give this address, they also create and curate their own book. And by they, I mean the women in the garden clubs. And the gentleman that you see, this is Dr. H. Hamilton Williams, who is a professor. He is the head of the horticulture department at Hampton at the time. He puts together this book. He is the editor of the handbook of the Negro Garden Club of Virginia. This is available online. You can, anybody can get it. And what's very important here is that he brings together, it's, it's essentially for us by us, like FUBU, for us by us. He brings together the top garden experts in the United States of America, puts together these books 
for these black women so they can study at their garden clubs. So people like David Burpee of Burpee Seeds contribute a chapter to this book. Um, people, his name is skipping me now, his last name is Skinner, who was the curator for the Morris Arboretum. He contributes to this book. Now, H. Hamilton Williams, y'all, another one I could talk about for an hour. He ain't just anybody. This man, his own mother was a successful florist in Roanoke. So he is a legacy child of horticulture. Two of his brothers were Tuskegee Airmen. They were uh, killed in combat. This is a gentleman that did the first academic survey of black vernacular landscapes. And though he was critical of his own people and their landscapes, his observations were, uh, uh, his observations were acute. His observations were very acute. He talked about them. Uh, there's hardly a black home without um, tires painted or flowers in tin cans. So he's very much describing this black vernacular landscape at the time. And so what's important about Dr. Williams is that he graduates from Hampton. He goes to teach at North Carolina a &T, He gets his PhD from Cornell and he comes back and puts this book together, which is just a fabulous, fabulous read to this day. And how did he even know all these people? That's what the real question is. And one of the people in the book that writes the foreword is Eleanor Roosevelt. Now I have a hypothesis here. I deeply believe that he uh, may have known her through the work of Mary McLeod Bethune, how she was very much showing up in the Virginia Tidewater region. She had her office in Washington DC as president of a black women's organization. She was very close uh, colleague of Eleanor Roosevelt. So that's my hypothesis. Clearly, we can't go back and ask anyone, and I've yet to find proof, but that's a pretty big deal for the first lady of the United States to write the foreword to you book, to your book. I will tell you this: if Michelle Obama writes the foreword to my book, I will fall out on the floor. That is how big of a deal it is for the first lady to write the foreword to your book. So hats off to him for having this just networking reach as a black man at the height of the Jim Crow era to reach out to all these people and get the work executed. So what are some of the things that they were accomplishing? I've talked about beautification and flowers, but I want you to see that these are their own words from that book. Uh, native resources beyond, they're not just talking native shrubs, they're saying using both human and material resources. So just highly intellectual thought, critical thinking, um, and just consideration there with what they're doing with the landscape. And I'm just gonna let a few of these pop up. I'm not intending to read them all, but I just want you to know in their own words, the type of work they were doing. Just self-expression, having institutes, uh, monthly meetings throughout the years, their own shows, giving their own awards. This is the one I love. The citizens have become civic conscious and they have become voters. So it wasn't just about putting pretty flowers in the ground. Y'all, it was about getting organized. We can demand things. We can make sure our sidewalks are repaired, our streets are repaired, our garbage picks up. Our mail is on time. This is the type of thing that these men, or specifically these women and some men in junior clubs were starting to get out of their garden club. So don't ever let somebody tell you that garden club work is frivolous. It's not. And I'll leave that up there for just one more second and I'll move on. So at the end of the book, there's an advertisement page and only four people advertise in this book. Um, for whatever reason, it's fine. Nobody wants to look at a bunch of ads anyway. Now, one of these folks, Sims Flores. Now I told y'all about Asa Sims and how I could talk about him for an hour. And I want you to see Sims Flores. Asa Sims lived on a two acre estate. It was so nice and beautifully laid out that he often hosted gatherings for all of these women. Thousands of people would literally show up to this man's house and have their garden events. And you can look to the right, you can see his greenhouses. And if you look closely to the square in the middle, it says Sims Flores. So where were they getting their plants? Well, they certainly weren't going down the Home Depot, y'all. They were probably going to people like Asa Sims and also doing a lot of propagation and pass along plants. And this is Asa Sims in his workshop. So not only is he a floriculturist, a state advisor to the garden club, he's also a full on florist. These are his children. Those are his two daughters to my right and also his son-in-law to the left doing work at his shop. So he really, really, really had it gone in the horticultural lane. Now the other of, of the four people that advertised, there was another one in there. And I don't know if you captured that because I've moved the slides so quick. And this is why I wanted to talk to you specifically today, Oregon State. Barnhaven Gardens in Gresham, Oregon, takes out an ad in the Negro Garden Club handbook 
1942. So what is the story for those of us who are not Oregonians or who are not familiar with Barnhaven Gardens? Well, I'm about to tell you because it is an amazing story. It is the story of Florence uh, Levy or Levi, L-E-V-Y. I'm from Georgia, not sure how you pronounce it. So I'm gonna stick with, uh, let's stick with Levy. <laughs> we'll stick with Levy today. This is a woman born in New Orleans. She moves out to Oregon as a child. Her father and um, mama moved to Portland and she grows up there and she goes off to school in Illinois, comes back. She is supposed to be a pianist. She is trained as a pianist. And what happens is uh, the depression hits, no money, ain't nobody about to pay for no pianos, none of that. People are just trying to get by. And so that derails her career. And so she gets married and they need a place to stay. And they happen to know a wealthy couple that has an old barn. And this is the barn that she and her husband were living in. And she called it their haven. And she said that when she went to this property, she knew there was a special connection there, Barn Haven Gardens. She takes her, the, the way the story goes is that she takes her last $5 and buys a pack of primrose seeds, primula seeds from an English garden catalog. And she uh, germinates the seedlings and takes some, plants them in front of the barn and plants the rest behind the creek. 1,000 of them pop up and word immediately gets out about Florence Levy's incredible, incredible uh, primrose garden. So she flips it into a business. And this is her on the right in the jacket. She's in her, I think, 30s then, maybe late 30s. But she doesn't just flip it into a business immediately. What she realizes is that, wow, my primroses are beautiful. I was just trying to do something to not think about the depression. So I need to go learn all I can about primroses. And she goes to the Oregon State Library and writes down for 10 days everything she can about primroses. Because at the time, Oregon State, and they may still have it, housed the Royal Horticulture Society catalog. There were only two catalogs in America from the Royal Horticulture Society in England, and Oregon State had one of them. And so she researches these catalogs, she studies and writes for 10 days, writes down everything she knows, and she launches her primrose business in 1941, 1942. And what she's known for is the hand pollination of her primroses, of the quality, the colors. So I love to just think and know that Florence at the time called Levy is literally sending primroses possibly to these women in Virginia. How does she even know about them? What caused her to advertise in this catalog when only three people, four people did, and one of them was Asa Sims, who probably got the ad for free. So these are the type of questions we really need to be asking ourselves, and we need to challenge ourselves to dig deep back into history to know the answers. Now, some of y'all say, well, I don't remember no Florence Levy, but I do remember Florence Bellis. Well, that is because she is the same person. She pulled an Elizabeth Taylor, husband number one, bye, bye Felicia, husband number two, I'm Florence Bellis. And she writes Gardening and Beyond. She also goes on to, I believe in 1941, the Primrose Society of America is formed out in Oregon. And she goes on to be the editor of the journal. So there is some real history there with the state of Oregon, Oregon State and the Negro Garden Club of Virginia and Florence Levy Bellis being one of the first sponsors of these women. So shout out to her for taking a chance when few people would. So moving on, we're gonna come back to Virginia. I just wanted to tie that in uh, for Oregon um, because y'all are special today, y'all brought me here. This is Mary Peak, and she is a uh, black woman that is born to a free black woman and her father is a white Frenchman. And she has the ability to read and write. She's a highly educated woman and she is a woman that is teaching black people, enslaved black people, and some of them were free. This is before the emancipation, how to read and write, taking a real risk. This is literally putting their life at stake to be able to be literate at this time. So the amazing story about her is that she teaches her classes under the Emancipation Oak. And this stands at the campus of Hampton today. It is one of the 10 great trees of the world by National Geographic. And it is the oak tree under which the first Southern reading of the Emancipation Proclamation happens. So this is a very important oak tree. Now, what happens um, in the 1930s? 
the lady on the left with the very cool, uh, I think it's called a pillbox hat on or derby, maybe that's called a derby, is named Mrs. Irma Thompson. She is the founder and president of the Ever Blooming Garden Club. And one of the educators at Hampton gathers some acorn seeds from under that emancipation oak tree, which is mighty famous at the time, and takes them to Irma Thomas and her garden club germinates them and they become seedlings. And she takes one of those emancipation oak seedlings and takes them to an elementary school that is called the Booker T. Washington Elementary School, where she is teaching and plants the oak tree there. And they named the tree, the Clark Oak. They named those seedlings, the Clark Oak after N.B. Clark, who is a pioneer educator in Virginia and also a classmate of Booker T. Washington. And what they want it to symbolize is that when children see that oak, they know to just strive for education, to keep their focus, to just be determined no matter what. And so they plant this oak tree. And this is a picture of them in the 60s and the oak tree has grown up. And you see that they're holding the sign that says Clark Oak seedlings from the Emancipation Oak. And it was planted in 1935. So down the road, this um, lady comes by, her name is Lillian Lovett. And she went to Booker T. Washington School and she finds herself at the school in the 90s, back at the school visiting, and she feels herself drawn to this particular oak tree. She doesn't know anything about the Clark Oak story. She don't know anything about Irma Thompson and she sure don't know anything about M.B. Clark and his legacy with Booker T. Washington. So don't let people tell you that trees don't have power or there's a vibe coming out of it because there was clearly a vibe to her. She could not understand what it was about this tree. So she starts doing research and she finds her own research in, about the story of M.B. Clark that I just told you. And she makes sure that a plaque is put at the school to recognize Mr. Clark and those seedlings coming from the mighty Emancipation Oak. And those are some children there working with the Ever, Bloomer, Ever Blooming Garden Club doing some beautification work around the area. So just a real full circle moment, this tree with the Emancipation is read off, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation is read, the progeny of those acorn seeds and then how they make their way. And as far as I know, the school may not be an elementary school anymore. I, I believe it's a middle school, but the tree is still there today. And just sidebar, you can name your trees whatever you want. You don't have to be stuck to botanical Latin. If you want to call it a tree, ain't nail, call it ain't nail. It's what the tree means to you. So you don't have to be so restrictive about your horticulture rules. You can give the plants meaning. Many, many cultures have, and certainly the African-American culture has a history of doing that. Now, I want to talk to y'all about a group that is the longest, uh, most consecutive meeting Black Garden Club in the United States. So since 1939, these ladies have met without stopping. Now, they're in Philadelphia. This is the Our Garden Club of Philadelphia and Vicinity our Garden Club of Philadelphia and Vicinity. They are legendary. They are, for an acronym, they call themselves the OGCPV. And when I say they are the OGs, the original gangsters of this thing, they really, really are. This club is started in 1939 by a woman named Marion, uh, I'm sorry, Harriet, Harriet Wright Haynes. Harriet Wright Hines. Harriet Wright Hines is her name. She's sitting in the middle. She's holding the book. You can barely see that it says garden. She launches this club in Philadelphia in 1939. And this club has a legacy that goes on to this day and I wanna show you about it. So I just wanna show you the spread of these garden clubs. This is the community garden club out of Portsmouth, Virginia. They're having a flower show, they're having an event and this is one of the attendees there. In 1963, the president of that club was a lady in, named Lillian Jones, was the president of the community garden club in Portsmouth. This is an affiliate, this is one of the Negro Garden Clubs of Virginia. This is one of those extended clubs. I told you they kept growing. Now, how does this connect back to today with the OGCPV? The lady that you see on the right, this is the Honorable Lillian Ransom. This is Judge Ransom. She sits on the board of the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society, and she is the current president of the Our Garden Club of Philadelphia and vicinity. She is a legacy. Her own grandmama, who you see in the middle, was a president of one of the Negro Garden Clubs of Virginia. And I think it is amazing. And I'm gonna do just a little light flex right now because I am fangirling out. In two weeks, I will get to meet Judge Ransom because I will be one of the judges at the PHS show. I've never been, it'll be my first time. And I cannot wait to sit at her feet and listen to her wisdom and that of her club because they are truly a legendary Black Garden Club in 
America doing this be beautification work hidden in plain sight. And I think they're the most award-winning club in PHS history. I think they've been presenting there since the 1970s. So I might have to come back and give another presentation to show y'all that uh, interaction, because I know it's gonna be amazing. Now, in terms of uh, garden clubs and um, also the influence of women, I want to show you this woman. Her name is Edwina Cruz. She is an educator in Delaware, Wilmington, Delaware. And she's also a controversial figure. She's got very famous friends and controversial in the sense that she is OK with lifting yourself up from your bootstraps, that type of um, education style, which isn't one size fit all. Everybody can't just lift herself up from their bootstraps. So she had the same controversy attached to her as Booker T. Washington. However, this is a brilliant woman with a lot of famous friends. And she invites these famous friends to speak at the graduations of her students. One of those people is Frederick Douglass, as you can see. Another one is Mary Church Terrell, who fought the good fight for women to have the right to vote. Brilliant woman, Latin teacher, uh, world famous educator in many, many things. W.B. Du Bois is also her friend. She brings him in. And she also brings in Booker T. Washington to speak to her students. And one of her students happens to be a man named Ralph Elwood Brock, who goes on to be the first black floor, for, the first black forester, the first black forester in the United States. And he credits Mrs. Edwina Cruz, who has come from Puerto Rico. Her mother is uh, Puerto Rican. Her father is German. So explains her, her fair skin there. And she he, he credits her and her love of nature for encouraging his career. So why is Edwina Cruz important to these um, careers in nature and, and into garden clubs, to be honest? Let me show you why. Oops, sorry, y'all, I hit the backwards button, but that's okay. Ralph Elwood Brock is a legend, a whole other person we could talk about for an hour and we'll move on. So Edwina Cruz goes uh, down to Trinidad and is the ward of a young lady who is named, uh, Etta Woodland, Etta Woodland is her name. She brings her back to Delaware. She teaches her at the Howard School where Edwina Cruz is principal. Etta Woodland goes on to Oberlin. She is an incredible um, music teacher. She plays all kinds of instruments, has a legendary career. And when she comes back to Delaware, she starts her own garden club. And it is the George Washington, garden, George Washington Carver Garden Club. They meet at the Walnut Street Christian Association in Wilmington. They have beautification events. They have floral contests. They have a, a fall event. They're just doing really big things in Wilmington, Delaware. And of course, she too is inspired to start this club by the Edwina Cruises of the world. So really it is the people in your life that can encourage you to do the work and move forward. And I just wanna check my time. I'm gonna whip through these next slides. I got about seven more minutes. So also, I want to introduce, it's a lot of Lillians here today. This is Lillian Edmonds. She's in Des Moines, Iowa. Who knew? This is a woman that studied to be a pharmacist. She studied to be a nurse. She couldn't get work there. So she said, you know what? I'm going to take it to the community. And she becomes the director of the Wilkie House, which is a place where African-Americans are encouraged. They are uplifted. They have community there. And they are uh, also taught educational programs. Now, Mrs. Lillian Edmonds, y'all gonna learn about these garden club women. women. I told y'all about the Honorable Judge Lillian Ransom. I told you about Etta Woodland. Mrs. Lillian Edmonds is in the Iowa Hall of Fame. There is a whole elementary school in Des Moines named after her because of her civic work that she did. And it's just incredible that of course she would belong to and also start a garden club there. And these are some of the children at her school. So this is where these garden club legacies go really out deeply into the community. Well, back to the rural side, y'all. This is Ozark, Alabama. This is the Daffodil Garden Club. And these are some of the charter members, 27 strong. So we're not really looking at plants today, but I just want to acknowledge the range and the reach of these women and never, ever forget the women from the country. These are women in Macomb, Mississippi. These are the Pike County winners of the garden club that's my alarm uh and that's just gone off so i'll give it about five more minutes and the lady on your right that is mrs uh eula um i forgot her last name but her first name is eula y'all so i bet her middle name is may eula may uh fortenberry eula fortenberry you know that's a mississippi name and i can say that i'm from the south i'm country i know the names and she is on the right standing there proud as a peacock because 
She has won the blue ribbon for having the best specimen plant. She's won the most awards that day and she's won the tricolor award for the quality of her specimen plant. So Mrs. Eula Mae Fortenberry, you can't tell her a thing about plants or a thing about her garden club. And I stand hundred percent because I just love these images of these women doing the work again, hidden in plain sight with no one to back them up, no one to pat them on the back. The master gardeners, in a sense, before there were master gardeners. This is Opal Washington. She was the black extension agent in Travis County in Austin, Texas. And this was the garden club that she supported. Now, Opal Washington is made more famous for the recipes that she wrote. However, we know I was an extension agent. You know that you answer all the questions. It doesn't matter if it's a snake question or a garden question or a canning question, you do the work. And this is the first black garden club in Austin, Texas. The lady that you see to the right is Mrs. Alice T. King. She owned a funeral home. So what does that mean? Of course she had landscapers and gardeners working for her. This was a wealthy black woman. This was a black woman that at one time was married to Mordecai Johnson, the first black president of Howard University. And what else the funeral home uh, workers deal with? Florist. So we know that she was likely working with black, maybe even white florists in Austin at the time. So we cannot ignore the richness, the storytelling, uh, the worth of studying these garden clubs. Now I'm going to take you to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. This is Mrs. Artie Halyard of the Town and Country Garden Club. This was a display that she did and she wanted to show uh, black achievement. And you see, I believe there's Willie Mays down there. There's probably Jackie Robinson. She takes these baseball figurines and uses them as a way to express flowers. Baseball is something that's her jam. She loves it. So I love just this ability to show your self-expression that these black women use in their garden clubs. Now, you, you just met Mrs. Artie Halyard. She's here on the right, still wearing her hat. And on the left is Mrs. Wilbur Robeson, Mrs. Wilbur Robeson. She has won 11 ribbons. I think that's at the 1949 or 1951 Wisconsin State Fair. Another person, you can't tell her nothing because she has won 11 ribbons. She is the most award-winning uh, person at that state fair, which is a big deal. And she's from this town and country garden club. And these women are intense. That is one of their shows. This is just this is just a visitor. So I can't even imagine how the entrance feels, but I want y'all to see the work that they were doing. It was incredible work. We are nearing the end and back to Mr. Asa Sims. I told y'all that he had a legendary career and this is him with a junior garden club member. I hate that I can't remember her name right now. It's in my notes if y'all need to know it. Um, and she's won an award with her junior garden club. So you saw young Asa Sims in 1932. Now he is at the end of the 60s with, and we can tell by his flip, honey, that is a, a wig on her head. I'm, it's not really a wig, but it could be. It's just that, that beautiful. And this young lady is excited. This is her arrangement. This is her work. She's a legacy of the beautification of these uh, women that do um, the beautification work through the Black Garden Clubs. So moving into the present, this lady in the back you see is named Queen Jackson. This picture is from 1985 and Queen Jackson is the literally crowned the queen, that's really a tiara on her head, of the what is now called the State Garden Club of Virginia. So they had changed the name, the times had changed, right? Of course. And she was a legacy of their club in the 80s. So I have this date here because I wanna remind you that next year, is the 90th anniversary of the Black Garden Clubs of Virginia. So on that day, we have to acknowledge these women. We have to acknowledge their work. Each club we could probably talk about for days and days on end. And I wanna thank you for your time now. This picture means so much to me because my first keynote address several years ago was with the, the Pine Garden Club in Georgia. And this is a historic picture of them. And what's sending me is this lady with her hands crossed to the left, it looked like she don't believe a word this guest speaker is saying. So this picture means a lot to me because this is the legacy of the first keynote address I had. And I thank all y'all, Oregon State University, thank you so much. I appreciate the guests. Somebody told me Hawaii was in the house. I don't think that's ever happened in my life. So shout out to y'all, Hawaii. And I specifically wanna thank Gail Langalato. I hope I said your name right. Um, I want to thank Kim Picorni. I'm in Georgia, y'all. I probably don't get this right, but I'm trying. And I also want to thank Leanne Locker. Uh, thank you so much from Oregon State. Thank you for having me here. And I just have to give a special shout out to Team Conquer the Soil that may be in the house today. 
uh, Mor Morgan Situates, who helps with my visual storytelling. I so appreciate you. Lori Deeker is trying to get us right so you can start wa rocking your Conquer the Soil gear. And I think our mama Ann is here as well today. And to my godmother, if she's on the call, thank you so much for showing up for me. I hope you learned something. I hope you feel uplifted. And I hope you understand the importance of beautification, master gardeners, self-taught horticulturists, self-taught plants women. We are out here and we are ready to change the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abra. That was so fantastic. And I'm so glad that you gave a shout out to the designers that you work with because we've had some great comments today, including um, Sherry who says, I love the content and the, the present presentation style. It's just so visually cool and interesting. And it's true. Uh, so thank you for that. And also, can we all in Oregon just have our minds blown again in thinking about Barnhaven Gardens in Gresham? Um, it makes me want to go to Gresham and get um, primulus seeds. What an amazing story that you shared with us about Florence Levy Bellis. So thank you for that. We have some questions that were both sent in from folks ahead of time, and we have a whole bunch of questions that were uh, shared in our Q&A. And so I'd like to ask you um, some questions in our final minutes. Okay. All right. So uh, Shannon from South Carolina wrote in and she asked, how can I motivate others to garden and to remove the stigma of farming that persists for so many people of color? I think. To, to remove the stigma. So it, there's truth and, and there's and there's not truth. And let me tell you what I mean by that. I'm going to try to make this a really short answer. Yes, there was some stereotype and there were black people who chose to not return to the land because it was a painful return and that is understandable and that is their choice. But there's also what I believe is this really false narrative. And you saw Tuskegee. I could have talked about the black landscape architects that came out of Tuskegee. H. Hamilton Williams, who came out of Hampton was a black landscape architect himself. There were black entomological artists. There were black floriculturists. There were black women that owned five acre nurseries and greenhouses. So I think that people just really don't know their history, know their greatness. And specifically, if you're talking, I think the person may have been trying to reach black children, remind them that their people were brought here in bondage, not because they were had marbles in their brain and they were dumb as rocks, they were brought here in bondage because they were exceptional cultivators of the soil. That runs through their blood, that is in their hands. The work is literally in their hands. So if you tell them that, that should get them up out of their seat and in, in their heart, they should be able to believe they can do mighty things with the land, with their hands. Their people are exceptional cultivators of the soil. Tell them that and tell them Abra Lee said it. And I mean it. Yay. Uh, one of our Instagram friends asked a question um, saying that I'd be interested in hearing from Abra on barriers she observes in mainstream gardening conversations to include um, BIPOC voices? The barriers to include the BIPOC voices? Um, and, and I guess they're saying barriers that I faced or barriers I think that are out there, maybe barriers that are out there. In, um, main, in mainstream gardening conversations. Well, I think number one is the languaging. Um, and I don't know why Americans do this. We need to just accept we are Americans and just that's what it is. So even the languages will say, and this is nothing wrong, but I'm gonna just tell you, this is not how people talk. They'll say, oh, this rose is so charming or this garden is so quaint. My friends don't talk like that. They're, this, this is dope. This garden is dope. It is so hot. This rose is popping. It is popping off like a Kool-Aid color. Let people speak and write like that if they choose to in your garden magazines at your garden talks. Nobody in the South is running around calling something quaint. We just, I mean, I know what it means, but who really talks like that? So I think that that's one way that I noticed that we we start getting some garden, garden knowledge and then we read the European way and then we start regurgitating it. And then it just sounds like a snooze fest. And we just got to lean in to these words we make up and just, rock with it and that's how we talk about our gardens that's one barrier is the language thank you uh Gigi asks what is the intersection if any between black churches and garden clubs Gigi, the intersection is these deaconesses at the church and i don't know if you know anything about a black church but if you are a deaconess or if you are a church mother you are somebody in that church so what does that mean you know who's getting married you know 
when to buy the flowers, if you, there's a history of black women with their own flower farms that were deaconess at churches. Why? They knew when people were dying. They knew brother Gene wasn't going to make it out of his tuberculosis situation. I got my flower farm. I got my florist. I'm ready. So these black women in these churches, the connection and intersection there is money. They were getting their coins because they knew to grow flowers for celebratory reasons and also for uh, funerals. And, and that's a real connection right there. Yes. Um, Melissa has a question. Uh, she says, thank you for this work and your work in positioning early black gardeners and florists and horticulturists to where they were very much present back then. Having said this, what is the importance of black American gardeners, florists, horticulturists present day being there besides just being black bodies in these spaces? I personally think if you look at what black culture has contributed to the world, jazz, Negro spirituals, hip hop, uh, soul food. I mean, literally the list can go on and on. The one thing that, and I, I don't even say that we didn't uh, do that, the vernacular garden, right? We even shabby sheep, you, you see those type of things repurposed. Black people been doing that. They had to do that. They wanted to do that. And I, and I wouldn't even just say black people, other people, especially people with less socioeconomic resources. So my point is this, if we can take a style, a clothing style, a hairstyle, a food, a language, music, and flip it, what happens when Black children, young Black children say, you know what, I'm going to be a landscape architect and I am going to plot all I know about technology. I'm going to plot all I know about the history of hip hop. I'm going to plot all I know about just Black culture being cool and make a landscape. It's going to be a botanical garden for literally that this should be on Wakanda or something like Black Panther. It is going to be that amazing. They just need to put their brain to it and get to it because there is not a culture that they touch that they don't flip into something amazing. Yes. Uh, what advice would you give to people of color just starting their career in horticulture? I would give them the advice of try everything. You can certainly teach yourself. I majored in horticulture. However, Auburn University didn't teach me what I taught y'all today. I taught myself. So don't let someone tell you you can't be self-taught. Don't be afraid to fail. I failed out of Auburn. Literally the horticulture program went back, graduated, got my degree, went on to be at airports and be an arborist. And I say that to say is that there's nothing wrong with being self-taught. I, I have that degree because my parents had the money and the privilege and to, to pay, literally pay the, the tuition for it, I can never out horticulture my mama that grew up in Barnesville, Georgia, or her granddaddy that raised her, whose mother was born into slavery, and he purchased the 27 acres for their farm. So don't let somebody tell you, you gotta have this and this and this to get where you need to go. You just need to focus, figure out what lane you wanna be in and just do it and teach yourself and try new things. And try new things, right? Well, uh, I know that Gail had said this earlier and I got really excited when I had heard this and I know that someone else in our Q&A got really excited because they thought they heard this, but did we hear that you are writing a book? And Gail, did you want to address that or Abra, would, do you want to talk about the book? Sure, Gail can talk or, or I can talk, it doesn't matter. Abra, so many folks um, are excited about your forthcoming book. We would love to hear just a little bit, um, anything you can share about when we might expect it on the shelves. The, so the title of the book is Conquer the Soil, and it is about, about 45 Black gardeners, farmers, um, growers that matter to America. So some of the people you saw today, Asa Sims, H. Hamilton William will be in that book. Um, some of them you didn't. And I, the, the scheduled date of release is September, I want to say 2022. I think we're in 2021 now. I am still writing. I feel like if you've seen the movie Ghost and Whoopi Goldberg and all those people are standing there talking to her and they won't leave her alone. That's how I feel right now. If I don't finish writing, I literally feel like these people won't leave me alone. And I know those are good problems to have, but I am trying my best, y'all. The, the, the difficult part of writing is this is putting together a quilt. I didn't go to Google for this. These people are no longer here. In some cases, their grandkids aren't here. So it has been a labor of love. And um, I think that it will be worth the wait when y'all see it because it is some exciting things. And there's so there's another Oregon story in there. And I just, 
I, y'all got to wait for the book for that one. If you figure it out on your own, good. But if not, I think you'll be really proud when you see it. 